Back in 1992, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a political scientist named Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History and the Last Man. In it, he made a very bold claim that for thousands of years of ideological conflict, liberal democracy had emerged as a dominant political system and would endure for the remainder of our existence. In short, democracy had won. Well, I think we believed him. But the problem is we may have believed him a little too much, because democracy is not some immovable object that once in place is invincible to all threats. It takes effort, thought, and struggle to maintain a democracy, just like it takes effort, thought, and struggle to implement one. And just like how in a democracy the power is in the hands of the citizenry, this effort, thought, and struggle must also be undertaken by us, the citizenry. I'm going to focus on three issues I think are highly relevant with our modern democracies, but most importantly are fixable if we put our minds to them. For Fukuyama to have been right, we need to keep moving toward more fair and intelligent rule, and fixing these issues will help us make that transition. The first issue is the lack of incentives to become a better educated voter. Now, the most cliche and conventional argument against democracy is something like this. Your average voter is dumb. Therefore, rule by a group of voters will also be dumb. Therefore, democracy is dumb. Checkmate, I should just go home and stop talking. Well, many a king and many a queen has also made a dumb decision. So to me, the most important part of this argument is the reasoning behind why so many voters are regarded as being dumb. The fact is, you won't be able to see the tangible impact from your single vote within a democracy in your personal life. With a king, he can see the direct results of every single decision he makes, and this will impact both him and his people. So at least in theory, he would be motivated to understand what he's deciding. In a democracy, it's not the same. I mean, why would you study up and learn politics when even if you do, your vote counts just as much as someone who flipped a coin to vote? As a student, would you study for a test where no matter what score you got, you'd still get a top mark? Because you could logically make the argument your single vote would not have changed any decision the government made. Yet if everyone thinks like this, well then, democracy ceases to function. Now, we need some way, some additional way, to incentivize voters so they will want to be better educated. But the history surrounding voter tests is a very touchy subject and is the reason I believe more governments don't employ them. In the US, for example, a very difficult voter test was used to stop African Americans and other minorities from being able to vote, and this is why this idea is largely just disregarded. But we need some way to incentivize voters, and this does not necessarily need to impact voting power. Why not have a government-regulated voter test where voters who pass would get a small stipend of money or a tax break from the government for doing their civic duty to be knowledgeable about politics? Every citizen would still get the same voting power, but at least citizens would be motivated to understand what they're voting for, even if it's just for their own monetary gain. Now, don't worry. The irony of my solution does not elude me. Me, the American, suggesting we shovel money at a problem to make it go away. I can't think of a more US solution to an issue. I mean, I'm literally suggesting paying people to do something that, well, quite frankly, they should already be doing. But that's not really the point. The point is we need some way to incentivize voters, and this does not necessarily need to impact voting power or be money. It can be pretty much anything. When Fukuyama wrote The End of History and The Last Man, democracy was not a given. It was a privilege. But now it's taken for granted, and voter turnout and involvement in most of the developed world has only gone down. So now we need something additional, something extra to incentivize voters, because the thrill of filling out that ballot just isn't doing it anymore. A second issue is not so much to do with democracy as in the, the voting system many democratic countries employ. Countries like the US, UK, and India all utilize a first-past-the-post voting system. Now what this means is every citizen gets one vote, and the candidate with the most votes at the end of the election wins the election. Pretty simple. Now, of course, in the US, it's a little more complicated than that. It's done by a state-by-state -state basis, and we have the Electoral College, a problem in its own right. But at least within each state, it's still first past the post. Now, initially, this seems like a very fair and logical way to run an election, but it raises a few issues. First off is the entire idea of strategic voting. Once again, in the US, for example, you'll hear people talking about throwing away their vote by voting for a third party candidate. And this is completely counterintuitive to the entire idea of a democracy, where you're intended to vote for your preferred candidate. Secondly, it encourages a two party system. Since every citizen gets just a single vote, 
the entire U.S. election is structured to end with one Democrat running against one Republican. Why? Because if we had two Democrats and one Republican, Democratic voters would split their votes between the two Democratic candidates, and the Republican would win every single time. So, you may ask, what's the alternative? Well, one promising option is preferential voting, and this is actually what they use in Australia. Now, here is an example Australian voting ballot. In preferential voting, candidates don't just have one vote. They rank their candidates in order of preference, hence the name, and the election process continues until a candidate has received a complete majority of all votes cast. Now, to help me explain this, because that probably made zero sense, I present you with a simple scenario. Here we have an election between Hamlet, Juliet, and Lady Macbeth. Yes, I know, very intellectual. I think my English teacher is probably very, very proud of me right now. Um, so here we have the initial voting tallies from the three candidates. And here you can see right off the bat why first past the post encourages a party system. Um, in first past the post, Hamlet would have already won the election. He has 39% of the votes cast. That's the most votes of any of the three candidates. But if Juliet and Lady Macbeth had similar policies, even though more voters leaned toward them, Hamlet still won. So it incentivizes a two-party system. However, in preferential voting, a candidate needs a complete majority to win. Since no one has over 50% of all votes cast, the candidate with the least votes is eliminated. I'm very sorry, Lady Macbeth. You are out. Now her votes, her voters, have their second choice votes added to the race. And for simplicity's sake, we're gonna say all those who voted for her ended up voting for Juliet. Now, Juliet has more than 50% of all votes cast, and so she wins the election. Ta-da! Now, there are a number of benefits to this system of voting. First off, you can get rid of this entire idea of strategic voting. Voters don't have to worry about their vote not mattering. They can always vote for their preferred candidate. In our situation, those who voted for Lady Macbeth still had their vote count toward the winning candidate in the end. Secondly, candidates who win off the second or third choice votes from other candidates may look into implementing some of those candidates' policies. So, for example, in our situation, Juliet may look into implementing some of Lady Macbeth's policies because those are the voters that actually pushed her over the edge and helped her win the election. And she can see that these voters already sort of lean toward her over the alternatives. Thirdly, it doesn't encourage a two-party system like First Past the Post does. And having a two-party system is a major problem. I mean, just look what's happening in the US right now. The entire country is pretty much being split apart purely on partisan lines. So, Preferential voting provides many advantages as a voting system. First past the post simply doesn't, and we would do well to implement it. Finally, I'd like to talk on a flaw not so much to do with democracy, but in what we value in our modern society. In an ideal democracy, we would have our best and brightest running for office wishing to lead us. Yet we don't usually see this. More and more so, politicians are frowned upon as being sly and sneaky. Kids grow up with dreams of becoming a pro athlete, an actor, or a wealthy businessman, rather than a president or senator. What we value and who we admire truly has a resounding impact on how we act. And since no one values politicians, no one wishes to be one. We need to change what our society values. The celebrities of today are not role models for how we should behave. We need to look back to the great people of history as role models, not the actors and athletes of today. Then, when politicians are admired and coveted, will the politicians who represent us also become better? This starts with you. Stop reading what the Kardashians are up to and learn about history. 200 years from now, no one is going to remember or care who Brad Pitt is or was. Yet it's been over 2,000 years and we still remember Plato. Learn about him or Václav Havel or Nelson Mandela or Rosa Parks, people who actually changed the world forever. These are the people we should aspire to be like, not the actors and athletes of today. There are always going to be problems with any form of government. As humans, we're prone to bad decision-making and illogical thinking. Yet democracy is still probably the best form of government we've come up with to date. Democracies give their citizens a voice in their governance and in general provide a higher standard of living for their citizens. But it's important to remember no government system is immune to collapse. If we stop paying attention to what's important in the world, democracy ceases to function. If we want Fukuyama to have been right and for liberal democracy to endure for the remainder of our existence, well, then we need to work to make it better in the future. Thank you. <laughs>